50 years before the creation of The Prisoner and a decade before the conception of Port Merion, the young Clough Williams Ellis found himself, along the rest of his generation, swept up in the Great War. This work is not a comprehensive biography of Sir Clough, but serves as an introduction to the early life of this talented architect. Over the years, a few details have been lost and apologies in advance are made for any oversight. Born in Northamptonshire in 1883, to the clergyman and poet John Clough Williams Ellis and Ellen Mabel Greaves, the young Clough was educated at Oundle School in Northamptonshire and briefly studied at Trinity College and the Architectural Association School of Architecture before opening his own architectural practice in London. With the outbreak of war in August 1914, Clough, like many young men, was caught up in the great call to arms. As an educated young man, Clough was a prime candidate for an officer's commission. He had some military experience as a volunteer trooper with the Inns of Court Volunteers, and after attempting to join the cavalry, Clough was commissioned as a second lieutenant with the Royal Fusiliers. He was only in the regiment a short time, as in early 1915, Clough volunteered for service with a new regiment. Established on the 26th of February 1915 by Royal Warrant, in order to include Wales in the national component of the Foot Guards, the Welsh Guards was the youngest of the five regiments of troops that are entrusted with the monarch's safety. In wartime, the Guards regiments take their place in the British Army's order of battle and are regarded as some of Britain's best troops. The new regiment appealed to Clough's Welsh ancestry and he volunteered for service with the new regiment. At this time, Clough married Annabel Strachey, the daughter of the journalist and spectator editor, John St. Lowe Strachey. Amabel herself would serve her country, working as a nurse with the volunteer aid detachment, before embarking on a career as a respected journalist and writer. Clough was not a natural soldier and was reprimanded early in his service for falling asleep in church parade, for which he was given an extra four shifts of guard duty. At this time, Clough's fellow officers raised a fund as a wedding present. Initially, they wanted to buy him an item made from silver, but on learning of his love of old buildings and at his suggestion, the money was used to buy a castle-like folly to be built in the grounds of Plas Bromdanway. The Welsh Guards would join the newly formed Guards Division, which would be shortly sent into battle for the first time at the Battle of Luce in September 1915. During the battle, sadly, Clough's cousin, Captain Osmond T.D. Williams, would be killed. A decade later, Clough would buy the Port Marion estate from his father, Sir Osmond Williams. It was in the aftermath of the Battle of Luce that Clough arrived with the battalion with a draft of reinforcements. His first duty in the line was to command No. 4 Company and to hold captured German trenches which were subjected to constant harassing fire from artillery and grenades. The trenches themselves were flooded and surrounded by decomposing corpses from the previous week's fighting. During the work to reinforce the trenches, Clough started to learn Welsh from the men he commanded. He did not make things easy during his time in the line and insisted on wearing a large piece of body armour he had purchased from England. The Welsh Guards after this were sent to occupy trenches in a quiet section near Orbers Ridge. In December 1915, they were withdrawn to a rear area camp near Calais to rest and refit and to train in the use of grenades. They were then sent into billets near Wormhout and Popperingi in Belgium. After a period of rest, the regiment was sent to Ypres where they sent to man trenches near Hooge and Railway Wood throughout spring 1916. They had to contend with flooded lines, bombardments, trench raids and occasional mine detonations. Clough would continue to serve in the Welsh Guards at this time until spring 1916 when he was offered a job with the divisional staff as an intelligence officer and a promotion to lieutenant. It was about this time that Clough was sent on his first aerial observation missions. The first one was in a balloon, 
where he was raised up into the sky. He was then targeted by every German artillery piece in the region. And after a hair raising 15 minutes, he was lowered down. Shortly thereafter, he was given a trip in a two-seater fighter plane to make observations of the German lines and occasionally to man the rear Lewis machine gun. Whilst based in the dugouts of the ramparts of Ypres, Clough as a hobby had collected and sold a number of items of architectural ironmongery from the destroyed city on which his commanding officer, Brigadier F.J. Hayworth, jokingly said was looting. Clough countered that this was not stealing, but sal salvage, which was encouraged. Hayworth allowed him to continue his salvage as long as he got a cut of the takings. Hayworth was shot and killed soon after whilst visiting the frontline trenches. As the summer began, the Guards Division was sent south towards the Somme. At this time, Clough remained on the divisional staff as an intelligence officer. The Welsh Guards would fight at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, where in September of that year, they would take heavy casualties of, at the Battle of Fleurs Corselet. It was around this time in 1916 that a new weapon of war emerged in France, developed under utmost secrecy through 1915 under a committee called the Landships Committee. This new weapon of war was designed to break the trench deadlock. Based on the armoured cars that had seen successful use in the first weeks of the war, the landship was designed to break through trenches, barbed wire and give protection from the machine guns. The name landship was thought to be too descriptive, so the ruse that these were mobile water tanks for the desert was conjured up. The name tank stuck and these new weapons would see their first use in 1916. To command this new force in battle, the Commander-in-Chief Douglas Haig chose a young but brilliant career officer who had served initially with the Royal Engineers in the Boer War and later in the opening phases of the Great War called Hugh Ells. Initially he was a Major but he was later promoted to Lieutenant General. He would become Clough's commanding officer and firm friend. The tank corps, as it was later known, was based around the Birmingham Chateau near St Paul in northern France. This area was a network of training areas, ranges, supply depots, repair yards and railway yards. The chateau itself offered the space the tank corps needed to operate its uh, intelligence and organisational areas. In late 1916, during a course on reconnaissance, Clough fell ill with the flu. While recovering, he borrowed a car and visited the supposedly secret headquarters of the tank corps. Instead of being arrested, he was welcomed by Hugh Ells, who was impressed by the young officer and shortly thereafter accepted his transfer from the Welsh Guards in early 1917. He was posted to the Intelligence and Reconnaissance Department. He was put under a younger officer called Major Frederick Hot Black, who had the nickname Boots. As a reconnaissance officer, he would be tasked with dangerous missions flying over the German lines. He would be at risk from anti-aircraft fire, enemy fighters and flying accidents. He had to locate the German trenches, barbed wire, artillery positions and act as the general's eyes. Battle plans would be drawn up on his recommendations. The reconnaissance officers would also make their observations of the German front lines directly from the trenches. Their contribution to success was vital. An unexpected trench or artillery battery could spell disaster. The casualty rate for these officers was greater than the officers manning the front line trenches. A reconnaissance officer was a job where medals were won, 
but they were all too often presented posthumously. Clough and Boots would make extensive observations of the German lines, and at one point they were targeted by an artillery battery, so much so that they had to dive into a nearby pond for cover. Clough distinguished himself in late November 1917 for his reconnaissance work for the Battle of Cambrai. 1917 had been a year of mixed fortunes for the British Army. Using experience gained on the Somme, a series of astounding victories were won at Arras, Vimy Ridge and Messines. After this, the initiative was lost in the four-month mud-filled hell that was Passchendaele. The tank corps were in action during these battles, but they achieved little due to the state of the ground. A week after the closure of the Passchendaele battle, and in dire need to have something to show for his efforts, the Commander-in-Chief, Douglas Haig, was persuaded by Hugh Ells to launch one last offensive before the winter set in, on the hard, relatively unscathed land at Cambrai. The plan, designed by John Frederick Charles Fuller, would use the tanks to attack in force. Victory in this battle would depend on good reconnaissance and secrecy. The general needed to know exact details of the German defences, how wide their trenches were, how thick their barbed wire was, how much artillery they had. The reconnaissance officers went to work in secret to observe the German defences. They were under orders not to discuss their mission with unauthorised personnel and while scouting they would wear nondescript overcoats with dark glasses to disguise their identity. Once the plans had been completed, at night the tanks left the yards at Erin by rail. Once they had reached the advanced railhead, they were covered by camouflaged canvas covers and then moved forward at night. Five million rounds of .303 machine gun ammunition, half a million six-pounder shells and 200,000 litres of petrol, oil and grease were brought up for the tank's use alone. At dawn on the 20th of November, the battle began. Firstly, a bombardment of a thousand artillery pieces that had been pre-targeted on the German artillery batteries. These guns then switched to the German frontline trenches. The survivors were then met with 437 tanks rolling forward out of the dawn mist, closely followed by supporting infantry. The tanks were led forward by General Ells personally, in the tank Hilda above which he flew the flag of the tank corps which he had designed. The British army advanced five miles that day, but the victory was short-lived. The Germans had time to destroy several key bridges in the area, and the advance bogged down in a bitter fight over ball and wood. Accurate German artillery fire and mechanical breakdown quickly depleted the number of tanks available. During the first night of the battle, Clough, Ells and the commander of the 40th Infantry Division, John Ponsonby, held a meeting in the ruins of the chateau where it was decided to press on as long as they had enough tanks. Clough was one of the officers that was sent forward to brief the infantry brigade commanders. The battle was halted on the 28th of November with orders to dig in and hold the positions taken. In early December, the German army counterattacked and despite a desperate defensive action, where all functional tanks in the area were mobilised, the British Army was forced back almost to the point they had started at. The tank corps had sent over 4,000 officers and men to Cambrai. Over a thousand would be killed, reported missing or taken prisoner. For his contribution to this battle, Acting Captain Clough Williams Ellis was awarded the Military Cross for gallantry and devotion to duty. In March 1918, the German Spring Offensive pushed the British Army to breaking point. The tank corps were used in local piecemeal defensive battles, but it was not till the Battle of Amiens in August 1918, where tanks were once again used en masse in concert with artillery and infantry. In early September, Clough's immediate superior, 
Boots Hot Black was severely wounded when he took personal command of a tank squadron to deal with a German defensive position. He was evacuated and for the remainder of the war, Clough served as his replacement. Boots would survive and serve again in the Second World War as General Hot Black, commander of the Second Armoured Division until his retirement on medical grounds. In November 1918, tank cooperations were wound down due to depleted numbers and the need to train new crews for the proposed massive tank-led offensives of spring 1919. The armistice of the 11th of November brought the war to a close. Clough, now with a young family to support and not eager to be sent to Germany for occupational duties, requested a discharge to return home as his skills as an architect would be in demand. Clough was demobilised with the rank of Major in the last weeks of 1918. Returning home, Clough and Amabel quickly got to work to write the first official history of the Tank Corps, which was published by the publishers of the Country Life magazine in 1919. Clough's former commanding officer, Hugh Ells, wrote the, wrote the preface. The book was popular at the time as it gave the public their first insight into the development of these mysterious and monstrous war machines that did not exist a few years ago. Clough, after an unhappy six months as a civil servant, then returned to his architectural practice, raised his family, travelled the world, designed many buildings and purchased the Welsh estate of Iberia from his uncle. He quickly changed the name to Port Merion and began to build his great architectural experiment. Clough volunteered for service in the Second World War, but was rejected as too old. He served in the local Home Guard unit, which was commanded by his brother Martin, who had served in the Great War at Gallipoli and in Palestine. Place Bromdanway was used to house evacuees and Port Merion was also opened for service personnel to take leave. Clough recorded a number of talks for the BBC and volunteered as a nighttime fire watcher while visiting London. The family maintained a connection with the Welsh Guards as Clough's eldest son Christopher would serve in the regiment as a lieutenant. He would tragically lose his life at the Battle of Monte Cassino on the 13th of March 1944. Christopher's name would be added to the Garrig War Memorial, which his father had designed two decades before. Reflecting on his service years later, Clough said, In the course of it, what I really cared about was not just defending my country, but having a country really worth defending. I saw fabulous destruction of life, wealth and beauty that continued for years, a destruction I had not only witnessed, but assisted in. It was all hateful to me. And the monstrous waste and cruelty of those years frightens me, even in retrospect.